All right, hold on one second. All right. Okay. What I want is for that little thingy to go away down there about subtitles, but we will just do our best. Hold on one second. Okay, so I'm waiting for Carrie to tell me that y'all can hear me and y'all can see me. Okay, good. Like I was saying, the internet uh, has been a little wonky today. So uh, hopefully you have a good vision and you'll hear me well. So welcome everyone. Uh, I've had a busy day today. I was on a two and a half hour call for the North Carolina Stroke Council. And I was trying to be an advocate for post-stroke care. And as you all know, I feel really comfortable with the hospital care we have for stroke. I feel pretty good about the rehab care we have for stroke. What I'm not feeling so good about is what they call the continuum of care in terms of that final piece. Once people go home, from the rehab from the hospital. That's the piece that I hope that my stroke recovery guide fills a gap in because I've just heard way too many people say that they felt kind of lost, they didn't know where to start, they didn't have a map. And I just think there's too many of you out there reinventing the wheel which is really unnecessary. That's why, you know, stroke support groups and Facebook groups are so important is because we need people talking to each other so people aren't having to figure it all out on their own. So if you were with us last time for rule number eight, uh, this to me was maybe the most powerful rule that we have. This is where we focused on acknowledging trauma and the truth that if we don't acknowledge trauma stress symptoms that we might miss an opportunity for you to get as well as you deserve to get. I got quite a few emails over the last week about um, people's reflections on the rule and how, um, how it really gave them a chance to sit back and think about this part of their stroke recovery journey. So I appreciated very much hearing from you all. We always like to start off with a recap and our recap for session eight is that I invited you to think about the possibility that you may be living with some degree of traumatic stress from your stroke. And I hope that we validated for many of you that a stroke is a psychologically stressful event. And for some people, it's even considered traumatic. One in four people we know from the research will develop post-traumatic stress disorder after a stroke. Many uh, people who have unresolved trauma, and what we mean by that is when you don't get the help you need, the therapy you need, you don't ever come down from that high level of physiological intensity, that we can have what we call stuck points. And what stuck points are, are kind of these fixed negative beliefs in different areas of our life. And we talked about safety, trust, power, esteem, and intimacy. And I invited you to go through those five areas with a journal prompt. And I wanted you to really think about what have been some of the deeper effects on how you view the world, yourself and other people, because that's really where the traumatic stress gets you. We talked about post-traumatic growth and that that can provide us with an opportunity for personally growing after a stressful event, making us even better version of ourselves than perhaps we were before. So the big question we asked in rule number eight is, do I consider my stroke to be a psychologically traumatic event? And I think for a lot of you, perhaps you've never been asked that question before. This is why I think it's so important to have neuropsychology and social work and you know, therapists, mental health counselors intimately involved with stroke recovery because I just don't think we're asking these questions enough. And in hopes of trying to get you to validate your trauma, I gave you this definition because so many people continue to think of trauma and PTSD as a military thing or a assault victim thing. And really it's a universally human response to any experience that involves the threat of death 
or serious injury, particularly when sudden or unexpected that results in intense feelings of fear and or helplessness. So I invited you to think about, does that definition map on to your experience of having your stroke? And if you would say yes, then you are at a 25% increased risk of developing these symptoms that you see here of post-stroke PTSD. And we went through re-experiencing, hyperarousal, avoidance, and those negative feelings. So just a brief recap on the re-experiencing. This is that feeling of being intensely triggered in your anxiety. If you smell something that reminds you of any part of the stroke experience from where you were when you had it to maybe an ambulance, the emergency room, hospital, ICU, there's all sorts of things that just trip off that fear signal in the amygdala in our brain that make us just feel very, very uh, amped up and make us feel like it's happening all over again. Some people have nightmares or dreams about it. Hyperarousal is that feeling of constantly being on edge, struggling to relax, feeling like you are always scanning your body to see if maybe you're on the brink of having another stroke, always being easily startled, feeling tense, these kind of things. Avoidance is trying not to think about it, don't want to talk about it, trying not to uh, have it take up any awareness in your consciousness. And unfortunately, that doesn't work. If that was a positive, healthy coping skill, I would be into it, but it's not. It always bites you in the butt on the, on the way out. Those negative feelings are, you know, just these blanket negative thoughts where you start to think in these very black or white terms that nothing good can happen, um, just really hard to imagine what your life could look like post-stroke. And so what we talked about, if those things are happening to you, then you need to validate that they're real. You need to give yourself some compassion. You need to take serious this idea that this is an extra layer of disability and that this is worthy of some type of outreach or therapy. And I tried to emphasize that traumatic stress symptoms exist on a continuum. You may have a smidge or a scotch, as they say, you may be so racked with anxiety that it's taking over your life. It's not either or. It's you can have a little, you can have it in some circumstances, or you can feel like, you know, I, I can't go back into that room in my house. That's where I had the stroke. And I don't know what it is, but when I start to go in there, my heart starts pounding, I start getting clammy. You know, all of these things are on the continuum of traumatic stress, and they're all worthy of resolving. We concluded by this idea of post-traumatic stress. And I know for some of you who might be far from this idea, it might feel kind of out there, but there's a whole area of psychology called post-traumatic growth or positive psychology. And the question we asked was, can you see that that's a possibility that you could increase your sense of meaningfulness, satisfaction, or fulfillment? And we had a really awesome back and forth on the chat um, where I was asking people uh, to confirm or deny different statements about post-traumatic growth. And a lot of you had positive things to say, like I value my life more. I know that I can depend on the important people in my life more now. Um, I appreciate, you know, every opportunity and every day. And, you know, that, that feel, filled my heart. I thought that was really positive. So today what we're going to do is transition into rule number nine. And I am excited to go through this rule because I spend a lot of my time advocating for people to advocate for themselves. And that's really what rule number nine is all about, insisting on follow-up care, developing a system to keep your long-term recovery on track. So as we start to talk about this, I would love to try to use that uh, little chat feature a little bit more and have some of you uh, chime in and just let me know, you know, when you left the rehab or when you left the hospital, did you feel like there was a good, intensive, structured program for you? Did you feel like you knew what to do? Did you feel lost? Um, did, did it feel, was it a particularly scary time? Because here you've got all the structure of the rehab and, you know, then we are 
uh, kind of thrown, you know, back into our, our own world. I think it's a, it's a scary time for sure. In those first few weeks and months after your stroke, that is when you should receive the most intensive care and rehab. Remember, the purpose of the hospital stay is to stabilize you to determine why you had the stroke and to reduce the damage from the stroke, right? Once you go into rehab, then we really start to figure out what are the specific functions that you need to regain. And we go on a plan between physical, occupational and speech therapy about exactly how it is you can move forward to regain maximum independence and quality of life. And this is good because we do know the sooner you receive intensive medical intervention, the better you're gonna do in the long term. But what I really worry about about is that next stage after. What happens when you leave the rehab center? That is what concerns me that we need to do a much better job there. Follow-up care after a stroke is really needed and deserved for two reasons. First one is what we call secondary stroke prevention. Prevention of another stroke through behavior change. And what this gets back to is something we talked about in rule number one what were your risk factors for having a stroke? Now, some of you don't have any known risk factors at all. And boy, that must be incredibly frustrating because you don't really have a target to go to to reduce the likelihood that you could have another stroke. But many of you fall within those top four or five risk factors. And going through a good follow-up care system the idea is your doctor, your team of providers are there to help you figure out how to better manage that risk factor. Number two is your long-term recovery really depends on how closely you are monitored, the types of rehab that you're offered, the intensity of the rehab that you're offered, how much care and support you have and how much education you have. So across the board, it really is a good idea, but why this is a rule is because you may have to advocate for these things. And the truth is I'm a realist. So I know that some of you don't have insurance. I know that some of you don't live in major metropolitan areas. It's not easy for you. And so for that reason, you know, we also have to make sure we're validating self guided rehab that we at least show people what are some free or low cost options to get them closer and closer to the best rehab. So what we're talking about with stroke uh, prevention is really behavior change, right? So what are the things science tells us you should be doing if you have hypertension, high cholesterol, type two diabetes, atrial fibrillation? And these involve behaviors that are going to be driven by you. And we know as psychologists that the why, the meaning of why we're making these changes is what helps us to get and stay motivated. If you're just doing them because the doctor said, it's really not going to stand the test of time. And this is why, again, when we first met, we talked about what is your why? And the more specific you can get, the better. So what I like are you know, wise about our values, right? I want to do this because I want to walk my daughter down the aisle. You know, I want to do this because I want to be the very best you know, mother I can be. I want to do this to be a great friend to someone who's really helped me before. You know, I want to live a full life so I can try to make the world a better place. Whatever it is for your personal values, that's what's really gonna keep you going. So when you're considering defining your why, what I want you to think about is reminding yourself every single day why it is that you are here, right? What is that purpose? What is that function? Let's get that off there for a sec. Okay, I want you to really believe that you can make those changes, okay? If you don't believe that making the changes in your everyday behavior is gonna have any impact, then chances are you aren't gonna follow through. The next one is setting positive goals. So instead of saying something you're not gonna do, say what you are gonna do. So some people fall into that trap of saying, you know, I'm not gonna eat uh, any more Oreos, okay? But what would actually be healthier and more positive is if you were able to say something like, I am going to eat one more piece of fruit a day. So you want it to be a positive statement. Okay, the next one 
is make it fun. And this kind of goes back to bringing the creativity into your rehab. We're all human beings. And if something isn't enjoyable or entertaining or fun, it, it just isn't that appealing. Okay. Using a buddy system can be a great way for uh, accountability, can be a great way to have more fun. And even if someone just knows what your goals are, a supportive person can check in with you and make sure that they're cheering you on. So 23% of you, if we look at the research, are statistically expected to have another stroke after your first one. But before you get nervous, that's when you don't make any significant health changes. So that's if you just keep living life the same exact way you were before your stroke. I don't know of a greater motivator than something like a stroke or a heart attack. That's when people typically have their come to Jesus moments and get really uh, real about exercise and good diet and all of that stuff. What science tells us is the very best thing for preventing a second stroke is in person, now this is interesting because telehealth might change this, discussions with medical providers where they teach you evidence-based stroke prevention measures. Now look at that. This gets back to my whole philosophy of why we're here together is I think it's very much about education. I think if you ask people to make changes and they don't understand why, it's very unlikely that they're gonna follow through. I think if you have a relationship with a doctor and you know them and you trust them and they make some recommendations, you're gonna be much more likely to follow through. But what I'm worried about in today's healthcare system is we're having less and less one-on-one -on -one time, which means less and less personal relationships between doctors and patients. And there's so little time during a follow-up appointment that I'm not sure that we are giving these recommendations enough time and enough support to help people follow through with them, okay? So what we're gonna do is talk about all that good stuff here. We're gonna take our power back and instead of just you know, waiting hand on foot for the doctors to tell us what to do, I wanted to create a system where you could learn this stuff through this program where we are today. So the first thing is we have to talk about our vascular system, right? If you've been here with me for a few of these sessions, you know that blood flow and circulation is critical. It's really what it's all about when it comes to stroke. And so the way we break up the vascular system is in two ways. What we typically talk about is the cardiovascular system. And we consider that to be from the top of the carotid arteries all the way down to the tips of our toes. Once we go from those top of the carotids up, we then call that the cerebrovascular system. Okay, so what I wanna do is just start off, let's just do a little fun work on the cardiovascular system. Okay, this is your body's network of blood vessels that includes your arteries, which takes the blood away from your heart, the veins, which return the blood to your heart, and the capillaries that are kind of in the middle there, which helps the transition between the two. And that's where we get so many things from. Our circulation system helps to transport nutrients, the fuel for the body, especially the brain oxygen. We get rid of carbon dioxide that way. That's how we move hormones around our body and glucose, of course, blood sugar. It helps us to fight disease. It helps us to stabilize our temperature, maintains general homeostasis, carries off waste. And the most important thing I want you to know about the cardiovascular system is the healthiness of blood vessels. When blood vessels are healthy, they have a few different properties. One is that they are elastic. They can expand and contract to meet the demands of what we're doing in any given moment. So if we have a lot of energy that needs to be expended to you know, walk up a flight of stairs, then the blood vessels are, have a system where they are able to expand to allow more blood through. And if we uh, have a bout of, you know, being calm and relaxed, they don't have to be quite so open. It's very important that the blood vessels stay elastic because otherwise we can't make accommodations according to what we're doing. And that can be very dangerous. So remember, once we go above the carotid arteries, now we're in the cerebrovascular system, cerebro meaning brain. And once we get into the brain, we have two major blood vessel supplies. We have uh, two big ones here in the front, your carotid arteries. And in the back, we have the vertebral arteries, which are about 
the diameter, diameter of our pinkies. And one of the coolest things about the brain is this vascular system because those two major blood vessels from the front and the two big ones in the back, kind of think of it like this, come together in the middle part of the brain and they form a big circle that we call the circle of Willis. And what that guarantees is that even if there is a blockage in one of those major vessels, there's a backup system, okay? There's always a redundancy in the system. And this is why people can live with you know, almost a completely blocked carotid artery. And really there can be no cognitive consequences because we've got all of this backup here um, from the other systems. Now, unfortunately, this isn't the entire blood vessel system for the brain, okay? And I'm gonna talk about that in a minute. Brain cells are dependent upon oxygen and glucose, right? But they can't store these fuels, okay? They can only hold on to them for about four to nine minutes. After about four minutes, we're gonna start to see some damage to the integrity of the neuron, the brain cell. And after about nine minutes, we're gonna see whole networks of brain cells unfortunately die. So this is the whole idea about time is brain, right? We wanna make sure that people get to medical care as soon as possible. Your post-stroke health goals should really be surrounding this idea of healthy blood flow to the brain. And remember, open elastic blood vessels are happy blood vessels. You see these little cutie pies going down the pike there and they're so happy to be bringing oxygen and glucose to your brain. We wanna make sure that we're not having narrow blood vessels so they can't get through. Now there is one intervention, if you survey all of the scientific writings about promoting healthy blood flow, there's really one thing that has the most scientific support behind it. And I'm wondering if you all can guess what it is. More physical activity. Okay, now notice I didn't say uh, working out more or working out with a trainer or lifting weights. It's very relative to where you are now. So any more physical activity tomorrow than you did today is a bonus. And you wanna keep trying to bump up the expectations for yourself and include different activities. Because remember, the brain really thrives on complexity, mastering something, and then taking it to the next level. One of the most recent insights from neurorehabilitation is the power of doing something physical and something cognitive together. And we're starting to call this combination therapy. So if any of you are in a routine of doing physical activity, whether it's chair exercise or swimming or walking, one of the things we're recommending is that you start to include little brain games in your mind so that the brain is having to multitask and manage to do two things at one time, dual task uh, focus. And so you can do things like, you know, time yourself for a minute and say, you know, how many um, types of green vegetables can I name in one minute? Uh, I want to try to remember all the kids in my kindergarten class. Can you imagine how fun that would be to try to, I almost think I could do that. I only had about 10 or 15 kids in my elementary school from, from kindergarten to, to sixth grade. And so I, I think I could remember all of them. Um, it's just really personal. It's just more physical activity, right? If you are kind of sedentary and you can start to make a commitment to chair exercise, simply marching in place, moving one or both of your arms you know, up and down, hey, that's better than you did today, right? And the whole reason we know it works is because if, strokes are related to a lack of blood flow in the brain or too much blood flow in the brain, we want to make sure we get it just right in that rehab. So I know all of you have been told many times all of the benefits of exercise, but I wanted to try to add a few things here that maybe you haven't heard. And the way I think about exercise is that there's both direct and indirect benefits. So the indirect benefits are all the things we know when we get it together and actually exercise, we know how it feels to be in a body that just was able to get some good physical exercise, right? We feel better, our mood is better. We get a better night's sleep. We can roll with the punches a little bit more, right? We don't get as stressed out or irritated by things. We have a reduction in anxiety. It improves our pain tolerance. I thought that one was very interesting and it's related to those endorphins that are released during the exercise. Makes us feel good when we exercise. I think part of it is we've all 
really internalized this idea of the power of exercise. And we all know that we should be exercising and we all feel guilty that we're not exercising. So not only does it physiological boost how you, physiologically boost how you feel, I think you also feel a sense of accomplishment. I did it, I committed to it, I did a good act of self-care. And of course we know it can dramatically reduce fatigue. And that one gets tough because the last thing you feel like doing when you're exhausted or you have neuro fatigue is exercise, but the research really supports any little bit of exercise you can get, even if you feel really tired after, don't overdo it, but any little bit you can do over time, you will be able to do more and more. Okay. Now, some of the direct benefits of exercise, I know you know some of these, but I think some of these will also be new to you. So surely you've heard that it improves blood pressure, right? It helps us to reduce the bad cholesterol. It helps us to increase the good cholesterol, helps us be less sensitive to changes in insulin or glucose in our blood, uh, helps fight inflammation, which, you know, what is inflammation? Well, here's a nice, happy, open blood vessel, right? And now we both sides, the sides of the the vessel wall get inflamed and what happens? They get bigger, but we lose space in the middle. So now instead of maybe being like this and being a nice open pathway for blood and all of the nutrients that it brings, now we've gone down like this and we've reduced the, the, the flow through, let's say, you know, 50%, that's not good for your brain. You can really improve your respiratory system the more you exercise, your body's ability to take in good, healthy oxygen and get rid of the carbon dioxide. But I wonder if you all knew this, that intensive exercise has been shown to improve the health of existing brain cells and to help grow new brain cells in the brain. If you would have told a brain scientist that, uh, 25 years ago, you would have blown them out of, the, out of the water because they still were believing that you were born with a certain amount of brain cells and after any kind of a brain injury, you lost them and then that was it. We know that that's a total myth. Okay, so this gets back to rule number one. You have to know your personal risk factors for stroke and then reduce them by following evidence-based recommendations. So what we're gonna do in the next few slides is go through the top four risk factors and I'm gonna tell you what the national medical societies who are experts on these things have to say that you should do. And I'll tell you ahead of time, there's a fair amount of overlap between the recommendations because sure enough, it turns out that things like exercise and diet are universal in terms of improving the blood flow in your body. But because so many of you have these going into your stroke, I really wanted to make sure that you at least heard uh, from my presentation, what are the science-based things that you can do? I also really like to explain these conditions because all too often I think people have them, but they don't necessarily get a good enough explanation of what's going on. So about two years ago, they changed the readings that they considered to be high blood pressure. And now we have it at 140 over 90. So perhaps you're not sure what does that top number mean? And what does that bottom number mean? Well, what the top number means is we measure that between when the heart contracts and the bottom number, the diastolic pressure is measured between oops, hold on one second here, is measured between beats when the heart relaxes, okay? So what you can see here in this open vessel is normal, is very nice and open. Pre-hypertension is a little low and hypertension is the smallest amount where blood can still get through. If it was completely stopped, then we would have a stroke, okay? So sometimes my patients will say to me, well, I had hypertension, but now they have me on a pill, so I don't think this is me. Unfortunately, vascular disease is very difficult to change unless it's in a big enough vessel in the heart where we can go in and stint it. Some of you might have a stint. And that's where we go in with the balloon. We push all the gunk that's to the side in the blood vessel and we're able to create more of a flow through. Uh, many blood vessels in the body are way too small for that. And of course we don't stint the brain. So even if you take medicine for high blood pressure, I still want you to listen and try to implement these strategies. So hypertension is the single most predictor of all the known risk factors for stroke. And why it's so important is very, very small improvements can significantly reduce your chance of having another stroke. So very important, right? 
I wanted to briefly go over with you all how to get the most accurate reading because I don't think we talk about this enough and these numbers are really important. So first of all, if you have a problem with blood pressure, please invest or put on your Christmas or Hanukkah list um, a cuff, a good quality cuff where you can start to keep a log that you share with your doctor and you take your blood pressure at least twice a day, if not three times a day. But how you do that, how you sit your body is very important. And also if you go into the doctor's office, I want you to do these things so you can get the most accurate reading. So the first thing you're gonna do, of course, is you have to make sure that you have a big enough cuff. We want it to fit over your entire arm circumference, not too small, not too big. So if you're very petite, or if you're on the bigger side, make sure that they're really wrapping it all the way around your arm when they get the blood pressure, okay? You're supposed to sit in a chair with back support, okay? So no stools or anything like that. Um, what we want you to do is put your feet firmly on the ground, Legs cannot be crossed, uncross your legs. You're supposed to have your arms supported. So like right now, I'm not on a chair that has great arm support. So if I were doing this, I might potentially just kind of have my arms loose. No, what we want is for the arms to be supported. This one is really key. You're supposed to have an empty bladder when you take your blood pressure. Now, how many of us are rushing around? We go to the doctor, you know, we're waiting, waiting, waiting. You don't want to go to the bathroom while you're waiting because God forbid they call your name and you're not there, right? You might have to take a minute and say, you know what? Got to run to the restroom because I don't want that to affect my readings. We also know you're not supposed to be talking. Now, if you're like me, when I go to the doctor, I have this tendency to kind of blab because I think I feel kind of nervous and I want to show the people that I appreciate, you know, what they're doing, especially like now with COVID, I want to check in and see how they're doing. As soon as they start to take that blood pressure, stop yapping because you got to get an accurate reading, okay? If your blood pressure is higher than 140 over 90, we want you to take it again because we want to make sure we're getting an accurate reading, okay? If you ever take your blood pressure at home and it's over 200 over 120, this is a medical emergency and is associated with a hemorrhage. So if you ever get a 200 over 120, I want you to take a break, take a minute, you know, go pee, come back. If it's again over 200 over 120, you got to go to the emergency room. That's, that's all there is to it. If you are prescribed medication for high blood pressure, I want you to take that medication as if your life literally depends on it. Okay. So what I have written here is I want you to take it perfectly. And this was a lesson that I learned when I worked at the inpatient stroke unit at UNC. I might have mentioned this to you guys before, but people would often come in after a weekend at the beach where they forgot their blood pressure medication. And even not taking the medication over two days dramatically increases your risk for a hemorrhagic stroke. And we do not want you guys to have that at all. Okay, that's very, very important. One of the most powerful things you can do to manage your blood pressure is managing what it is you put in your mouth, okay? So what we're gonna do here is go through the 2020 International Society of Hypertension Global Hypertension Practice Guidelines. How's that for a mouthful? And these are the lists that they have put out based on research that they know helps people manage their high blood pressure to the max. So what they talk about, healthy diet, right? Rich in whole grains, rich in fruits, vegetables, polyunsaturated fats, and they recommend dairy products, which is a little controversial. They want us to reduce foods high in sugar, saturated fat, especially trans fats. Those are probably the worst. And they approve of something called the DASH diet or the MIND diet. And those of you who have a copy of the Stroke Recovery Guide, you know that at I Care For Your Brain, we support the MIND diet and we help you with that in the um, guide where we have a interactive box where you can try to make improvements on how much of that diet you're following. It's basically a combination of the DASH diet 
and the Mediterranean diet. And it's been the only evidence-based diet to show that it slows neurodegeneration, reduces cognitive impairment after a stroke. It's really powerful stuff. They support uh, increasing your vegetables that are high in nitrates. So now I'm back to the hypertension guidelines. Um, they really recommend things like leafy green vegetables and beets beetroot. They uh, encourage people to eat foods high in magnesium, calcium, potassium. So things like avocados, nuts, seeds, and beans. I love beans. Um, healthy drinks, uh, moderate consumption of coffee, black tea, green tea. And I thought these next few were interesting. Hibiscus tea, pomegranate juice, beetroot juice, and cocoa. Uh, they want us to avoid using salt uh, while we're preparing foods and also at the table. It might be a good idea to just take salt off the table, right? It's very tempting sometimes out of habit to just sit there and continue putting it on your food. They really want us to cut out things like soy sauce, fast foods, processed foods, including bread and cereals that are high in salt. Salt and sugar are two of those things. If you just get into a good habit of looking at the box before you buy it, it's really important to make sure that you find where those things are hiding in your food. Many things you would never think have sugar in it, like crackers, can be very, very high in sugar. They advocate for the use of fresh herbs instead of things like salt and processed foods to give your food a little bit more oomph. They talk about the power of reducing any fat you might have in your stomach. That's something that they've shown in their research is really helpful for high blood pressure. And of course, regular physical exercise. Now, every society medical board recommends exercise and they all have a slightly different way of making their recommendations. So what this group has to say is that they think for preventing and for treating high blood pressure that folks should be engaging in 30 minutes five to seven days out of the week for things like jogging, yoga, cycling, swimming, and strength training, resistance strength exercises two to three days of the week. They also prioritize the importance of reducing stress and inducing mindfulness, right? I bet some of you know what mindfulness is. It's the whole idea that the past is in the past, the future is unknown, and what we have is right here, right now, this day, this moment. Chronic stress is very much associated with elevated high blood pressure, especially as we get older. Very important that we try to develop daily routines for managing stress. We also are recommended to reduce our exposure. I thought this one was really interesting. Air pollution makes sense, right? Nobody wants to bring in pesticides and you know, run off and all that, but avoiding extreme colder temperatures. I thought that one was rather interesting. So that might be for those of you who, you know, live off in Alaska or something like that. There are three foods that have been associated with a reduction in hypertension. I wanted to go through those with you. Um, the first one is whole grain, high fiber breakfast cereal. So this would be something with low sugar, obviously. There was a study in 2016 that showed that people who ate this every day um, reduced hypertension in the mild to moderate ranges by 20%. Now that is a whole heck of a lot. That's a big deal. Flax seeds, dietary flax seed resulted in a powerful reduction in blood pressure in patients with peripheral artery disease. So what that is, is things like neuropathy in your feet, retinal neuropathy in your eyes from diabetes, high blood pressure, these kind of things. And what you want to do with flax seeds, of course, is buy the ground up ones because when they're in their pure seed form, we can't really digest them and we just pass them through our system. So you want to try to find the ground up stuff. In a 2015 study looking at women who were aged 45 to 65, they had half of the group eat the equivalent of a cup of strawberries every day for uh, blueberries uh, every day for eight weeks. And they had another group who just had regular cereal. And what they found was that the blueberry group had the top number, the systolic blood pressure dropped by five points. And Again, very, very significant with blood pressure. So now we're gonna transition into talking about high cholesterol. Now, sometimes a picture is worth a thousand words. So you can really look at my image here and get a sense of the damage of what bad cholesterol does to us. So all that yellow stuff there is the waxy cholesterol, the bad stuff. 
this is the LDL. And the red part in the middle there, that's the, the reduced blood flow that's able to get through. So now that you know what's so key is healthy, big, open, elastic blood vessels, you can see that that's really bad, right? We don't want that to happen. And if that little narrowest part in the middle of the, the blood flow were to get completely closed off with cholesterol coming in from two sides, that would be an ischemic stroke. So within cholesterol, it's really important that you understand the two different kinds, okay? So HDL is our friend, and you can think of that, I think of the H as like the happy cholesterol, okay? This is the good kind, and this is the kind you want to be high, high, high. The bad stuff is the LDL, okay? And the difference is the type of molecule, right? We have high density and low density. The LDL is the bad kind, and that's the kind we want to be low. With high LDL, what we what we get is these this is the bad kind right so these are the fatty deposits that you can see are built up here in my image right over time that can hurt you in two ways it can completely close off blood flow when you get an ischemic stroke or over time those little deposits can break off and they float upstream until they can't pass through anymore so depending on the size of that little clot that fatty deposit that piece of cholesterol if it's big you're going to get one of the big vessel middle cerebral artery strokes for example if it's little it's going to keep going until it basically can't go anymore and it gets stuck and wherever it gets stuck is where you're going to have your stroke okay that would be an embolic stroke right the high HDL though, the happy stuff, what it does is it protects us against those effects because it goes around and it attaches to the bad cholesterol and it removes it from the bloodstream, brings it to the liver where we then break it down and get rid of it, okay? So the higher your levels of the good stuff, the HDL, the more protection you have against another stroke. So the greatest benefits come when your HDL is over 60 and we want your HDL level to be, be below 35, um, HDL levels below 35 add to stroke risk. Okay, so we want your HDL to be somewhere above 35, right? And ideally over 60. If it's lower than 35 or around 35, you've got some work to do. So this sounds great, right? Of course I want the good cholesterol. Get all that crap that's in my blood vessels out, okay? So how would you increase this on your own? Well, this is where the healthy fats come in, heart healthy fats. We also want you to be eating more fruit with high fiber, things like apples, pears, prunes, eating small fish, Fish oil, supplements, pills are better than nothing. But what we really know is more of a whole foods approach to the omega-3 fatty acids. And that would be to actually eat anchovies, mackerel, um, krill, those little stinky little guys, eating avocados, eating oatmeal, increasing your physical activity. And just a few months ago, a report came out that showed that practicing yoga increases your HDL. What we know about managing cholesterol, and these are all evidence-based recommendations. These are from the American Heart Association. First thing, just like stroke recovery, you gotta know your numbers. You gotta know your personal medical information. So any adult over the age of 20, you should have your cholesterol measured at least every five years because early intervention is key. With all of these issues in blood vessels that stop them up and reduce blood flow, it's a very, very cumulative problem. People don't just develop an ischemic stroke. It's typically years, if not decades, of a slow buildup of cholesterol. And the more it gets stuck in the lining of your blood vessels, the harder it gets and the harder it is to, to get in there, manipulate it, and, and have it wash away. So I want you to know your numbers. That's really important. Sticking to a healthy diet, again, right? Less saturated fat, less trans fat. We want you to eat more things like nuts, seeds, olive oil, water soluble fiber is really important. That really gives the bulk to drag these things through your blood vessels and to get rid of them. So oats, beans, lentils, who doesn't like lentil soup? Lentil soup is amazing. Um, again, less sodium, right? We don't want you to be relying on salt to get flavor in your food. Now the American Heart Association recommends 40 minutes of moderate to vigorous exercise three to four times a day. So the last group that we had, recommended, I believe it was 30 minutes a day. So this is what you're going to find. It pretty much goes from 20, 25 minutes a day to 45 minutes, right? And you, you get to decide for you what works. Maintaining your weight, 
working on losing weight in a healthy way, losing five to 10% of your body fat can make a very big impact on your cholesterol levels and lower your risk factors for a second stroke. But what I want you to hear is please don't just count on your medication or your statin, right? If you have high cholesterol, you also need to be making lifestyle changes that will enhance the benefits of your medication and will give you that, that extra oomph that you need to not have a second stroke. I get more questions about statins than probably any other medication. And so I did wanna include a couple slides on statins because I know many of you are curious about them. And there's a lot of kind of a negative talk. I had a patient this week who said she was recommended a statin, but she didn't take it. And I said, why? And she said, well, I had a girlfriend that told me they were bad. And I think there are a subgroup of people who have bad experiences with statins, either through leg cramps, generally just feeling bad and brain fog or memory issues. And like anything, people who are not having a good time are gonna be the loudest people, right? And so I want you to understand the science and you make the decision for yourself. So statins are the most prescribed drug in America. They absolutely lower your risk of having a stroke and may reduce the severity of a stroke if one exists. So think about it. If one of the types of ischemic strokes are those embolic strokes where you have, say, a, a piece of cholesterol and it's in your heart and it breaks off and by the time it gets to your brain and it you know, loses its way and it gets stuck in a blood vessel, you know, that's, that's where you're going to have your stroke, right? So the bigger the break off, the more significant the stroke, because it's going to stop earlier in a wider blood vessel, as opposed to getting into the smaller parts of, in the brain, there's different areas where blood vessels get really, really small, like the diameter of a piece of hair. And so if it's a tiny little piece of crystals and cholesterol, it's going to go all the way till it gets stuck in one of the smaller areas, that's going to be a smaller stroke. If it breaks off and it's a really big chunk, then it's gonna get stuck you know, anywhere from the carotid arteries. And if you get a blockage down here, that internal carotid artery supplies you know, a huge part of that whole hemisphere and, and you're gonna have a massive stroke. So anything we can do to reduce the bad cholesterol is really important. Large research studies have drawn clear ties between the use of statins and decreasing stroke risk. So look at this, statin use reduces stroke risk by 21%. And every 10% reduction in the bad LDL cholesterol resulted in a 15.6 reduction in stroke. That's pretty powerful stuff. We think that they work by helping to stabilize the existing plaques and reducing the likelihood that new plaques are going to grow. So the more anchored the plaques are in your blood vessel, the less likely they are to rupture, right? The less likely they are to break off and then float downstream. So we know when a plaque ruptures, that piece of the plaque breaks free, get carries away through the bloodstream and lodges in whatever artery uh, it finds. We also know that statins significantly reduce inflammation in the brain. So all this sounds really good to me, okay? What happened was in uh, 2012, the FDA put out a memo that got people kind of spooked. And basically it said, we've heard enough cognitive complaints about statins, so brain fog and memory, that we are gonna put a committee on it and we're gonna get back to you and make recommendations about who should use statins and you know what milligrams and might certain people uh, get memory loss. So five long years passed and uh, finally they came out with a statement that basically said, there's not enough evidence for us to make a definitive conclusion. So basically we learned nothing. Um, but what I can tell you is for people who talk about memory symptoms, almost always, and this is in the research and in my own clinical experience, the memory problems seem to reverse once the memory is stopped. Now, what some research that just came out last year has helped us understand is that the memory complaints have a lot to do with what type of statins people take. And there are two different types of statins that I wanna teach you about right here. There's something we call lipophilic statins and there's something we call hydrophilic statins. Now the lipophilic statins more readily cross the blood brain barrier as compared to the hydrophilic ones. So these ones are more likely to get into the brain. And what we think is that because statins are so good at what they do at reducing and breaking down cholesterol is that 
likely they take too much fat out of the brain and the brain desperately needs fat. Fat is the covering on the connectors between two brain cells. That's the myelin sheath. It's made out of fat. And if we take too much out, we're probably getting trouble with transmission between different brain cells or brain networks. So I'm not a physician, right? You have to remember that you're going to have to talk about this with your doctor, but what I would recommend to, you know, someone I cared about very much is if possible to go towards more of the hydrophilic statins. What I would like uh, to know is that we have neurologists and cardiologists that are making these decisions, helping you figure these things out based on your history of having a stroke. So I have a list for you here, the lipophilic ones, Lipitor, Zocor, Mevacor. These are the ones that we think more readily get into the brain that I would suggest that you talk to your doctor about perhaps transitioning to a hydrophilic one. This is things like Crestor, okay, that don't seem to get into the brain as much. Now, everyone is different. You can't make this decision based on me. You got to talk to your doc. Um, but what I do want you to know about statins is they're is a subpopulation. We think maybe people who have liver issues, there's some suggestion that people who have longstanding depression do not respond well to statins. But overall, the positive effects of statins in terms of stroke risk way outweigh, in my opinion, the negative. So I, I never would want to hear someone who's had a stroke say, I don't want to take a statin. I would really like you to try it because I think the, the positive benefits outweigh it much more. So now let's transition to diabetes. Uh, when blood sugars are poorly controlled, insulin levels are imbalanced. And this is when we get inflammation, we get kind of a tearing of the inner lining of the blood vessels. And we don't want that, right? Because the tearing uh, leaves open areas where cholesterol can kind of tuck in. And then we're getting that narrowing of the blood vessel. We don't want that. Remember I said before, our brain cells can only store their fuel, glucose being one of them, uh, for a short amount of time. So they're very dependent on a constant steady stream from your blood supply. So connecting this to diabetes, what we really, diabetes, if it's well controlled in and of itself is not a big concern. Where we really get concerned is poorly controlled diabetes, particularly when there are very high or very low spikes in blood sugar. So anything below 80 and anything above 200 is damaging your brain cells, no question about it. And look at this, the part of the brain where we make memories called the hippocampus, this is the most vulnerable, susceptible part of the brain to damage from these dramatic shifts in blood sugar. So if you have blood sugar that swings low, swings high, you are hurting your memory. So what the folks who study diabetes tell us to do is the most important thing, and this sounds like a, common theme is to work closely with your doctor. We need communication, we need goals. We wanna be involved with treatment planning, right? What is your why for the big picture? Why do you wanna you know, be a better controlled diabetic? Well, um, there's, there's plenty of reasons not having a second stroke might be a very motivating factor. We again want you to choose a diet that works for you. Uh, having diabetes is probably one of the hardest medical conditions to manage. Um, you can feel very deprived. It takes a lot of work to check your blood sugar. Um, you have to make, you know, when you're at the party, you can't have the slice of cake. You know, you, you think, all right, well, hey, I'll have a baked potato. Oh, wait, turns out baked potatoes got, you know, turns into sugar. So it's tough. It's not easy for sure. What we want you to do is monitor your daily glucose levels plus your A1C, right? That is kind of a average of your blood sugars over a longer period of time. And that's more accurate to understand how well you're actually managing your diabetes. I want you to have these in a log. This shouldn't just be something your doctor knows and your doctor cares about. Own your numbers. And remember what I said with the daily checks, under 80, over 200, that's a problem. You have to do more work changing your behavior to get those numbers closer together. Participating in regular physical activity, taking your medications just like uh, they're prescribed and no smoking or using tobacco. The last risk factor we're gonna get into is AFib or atrial fibrillation. This is the most common type of heartbeat irregularity in adults. So this is when the left atrium, the upper chamber of the heart 
can kind of quiver instead of being on a regular beat pattern. It can slow a little bit. Um, then we can get rapid contractions. Often people with AFib will tell you, oh, just my heart just feels like it's kind of fluttering, bouncing out of my chest. These rapid contractions of the heart are weaker than normal contractions. Even though they're faster, they're not as forceful. And so this is where we can get slow flow, as they say. When we have slow flow, the pool, the blood can pool and become sluggish and more sticky. And this is where we can get a blood clot, okay? Blood clot sitting in the heart is not great, but where we really get concerned is when the clot through a big old pump, once the heart is getting back into rhythm, shoots the clot out of the heart and again, travels all the way up to the brain. This is where we can have an ischemic stroke. So we don't want that, right? We call those either um, thrombo, embolic strokes. Uh, sometimes people call them a thrombus. Um, AFib increases your risk of a stroke by four to six times. That is a very, very impressive number, okay? Treating individuals with something called warfarin or the new blood thinners reduces the rate of stroke for those who've had AFib by at least a half, up to two thirds. Holy smokes, that is some powerful stuff. So with AFib, the American Heart Association tells us again to keep talking with your doctor to see if you're a candidate for a blood thinner. Um, aspirin is oftentimes used, but you want to make sure you're on the right dosage. I see sometimes people are on an 81 milligram plus a blood thinner. Depends on what your cardiologist says, if that's a good idea. Some people don't realize what a powerful blood thinner aspirin is. Some people are doing 325 milligrams, the big old aspirin every day, and they're taking a blood thinner. With the viscosity, the thickness of blood, it's really important. We don't want it too thin and we don't want it too thick. We want it to be right in the middle there. That's why with a lot of the older blood thinners, they have you go and check your, uh, I think it's called uh, INR. Often, I know warfarin, you have to do that. Um, because they, they don't want it to be too thick. They don't want it to be too thin. You got to be right in the middle there. And with those medications, as, as some of you know, who take them, you have to be wary of things like eating greens because it can make the blood too thin. Again, res regular physical activity, following a heart healthy diet, make your blood pressure a priority. Uh, your AFib is going to be a lot worse if you have hypertension. Avoiding a lot of alcohol or caffeine, maintaining a healthy weight and no smoking or using tobacco. So an important point when we're talking about vascular health is that very few people actually have one risk factor for stroke, okay? And that's because they kind of follow each other around and one begets the next. So once you have more than two, each one gets harder to control because each one is kind of aggravating the other, okay? And it can be kind of a downward spiral that creates more impairments. And things like diabetes really do require a certain level of cognitive ability to remember to do it, to keep an organized log. And sometimes having the diabetes makes it harder to follow through with those plans and, and have that high level of organization. So early intervention is key and aggressive intervention is important. All these things are, are very cumulative over time. They really build up. So what we get worried about with the brain, remember before I said, we've got the two big arteries here, the second big ones in the back, and that makes that nice circle. Well, in the middle part of the brain, we're not so fortunate to have backup. These are very, very, very small blood vessels. I said before about the diameter of a piece of hair. And so you can imagine how little cholesterol has to build up in there to block those off, okay? And I'm gonna show you some CT scans in a minute where uh, we see what that looks like. And this gets concerning because if we're talking about losing the openness of blood vessels and that that hurts our brain and creates a greater risk for stroke, well, it's gonna be the most damaging in those teeny tiny blood vessels, right? Because there's just uh, less, less space for them to close up. So we get worried about them because they're smaller, they're less elastic just because they're so teeny tiny, they don't have much room to move back and forth. And they're found in the heart the eyes, the kidneys, the feet, and the brain. So one of the things we say in neuropsychology is that what happens in the feet happens in the brain. And that's because they're a similar distance from the heart. The blood has to travel about the same distance. And the teeny tiny little blood vessels, this is where we get things like peripheral neuropathy because we get damage in these teeny tiny blood vessels. And the same thing can happen in the brain.
So I want to help you guys understand what happens besides vascular disease, like what is the consequence of vascular disease, especially as it relates to thinking and memory, okay? So what happens when we don't have good blood flow to the brain over time? Well, this is where cerebrovascular disease comes in, and I want to talk to you about this spectrum. So remember before we talked about traumatic stress. It's not either or, right? You can have a smidge, you can have a little, that little can build up. The first thing that we see with cerebrovascular disease, where the blood vessels are closing up or cholesterol is building up, is something called chronic ischemic white matter disease. Once we have that, the next phase is we can have vascular cognitive impairment. And if that continues to get bad, we have vascular dementia. So I wanted to take a few moments to talk about these things because I think that they're very important. So I want you to look at my brain picture here. And remember before I was talking to you about the big carotid artery. So I'm going to put my little arrow here. So can you see those right there? Those are the big guys. But what I'm talking about now are these little tiny guys that are coming off of that. There's like four of them kind of going like that. Look how much smaller they are and look how they're all on their own. They're one-way streets. They don't have any backup coming in. If they get clogged up and break off, that's it. So the smallest blood vessels are deep within the brain. This is the subcortical area. So what else is in the subcortical area? These are things like the basal ganglia, okay? And I know quite a few of you out there have had basal ganglia uh, strokes. And so when you get a brain scan, oftentimes if you read the report, it's going to comment on this chronic ischemic white matter disease. But a problem we have in neurology is that we don't have one word for it. You may see it called small vessel disease. You may see it called white matter disease. It can be called lacunar infarction. It can be called perivascular white matter disease of aging. It can be called leukoariosis. It's unfortunate that we just don't use one word, but basically it's irreversible injury to brain cells due to reduced blood flow, okay? So let me show you some brain scans. Now, this is so common that you may have had a brain scan to, to see on your stroke, or if you had a scare to see if you had another stroke. And when they find this, it's not even report worthy to most doctors because it's just so common. I always wanna tell patients about it because to me, this can be motivating information to get on top of your brain health and your vascular health more because we don't want this to build up over time. So if you see the brain, it's to my left, the one that has the least amount of white glowing on it. Let's just call that a healthy brain, okay? The next one has what we would call mild ischemic disease in it. And why we call it white matter disease is because of those white spots on the brain scan. And all they're doing is showing us that those teeny tiny little blood vessels have become what we call occluded and they either filled up with cholesterol and they've died. And, and when things in the brain die, they typically fill with water, cerebral spinal fluid. And so that's what the white is really showing you. That's why one of the terms is called a lacunar infarct and lacunar means lake. So sometimes we say they look like little tiny lakes on the scan. Um, and what we can see in this instance is we would consider that to be relatively mild, okay? If you get over into the last brain, this is what we would call moderate to severe. And this is a little bit controversial in brain science. We don't think the mild stuff quite does anything, but once we get into severe, this is where we have an increase in stroke risk and cognitive symptoms, okay? So the brain and the heart can handle decreasing blood flow for a pretty, pretty long time without any outward symptoms. You can have this white matter disease Disease, kind of building, 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 and you might not even notice that it's anything significant. But once it gets to the moderate or severe stage, what we can see is that you're having more problems, say, with your uh, remembering to do things, with your word finding, and it's not at the level of dementia. You're still independent in your everyday life, but it's more than age. It's not just because you're 70 that you're having these problems, okay? And so typically they result in difficulty with quick retrieval. And it's so common that some people even just call it normal aging, but really, especially in American society, it's this white matter disease. So um, we can see symptoms with a little bit of trouble with balance, a little bit of kind of a flatness, a lack of interest, a lack of motivation. And this can look like depression, but if you ask the person if they're guilty, if they feel sad or hopeless, 
they don't really it's just there's kind of a kind of a flatness there we also can see trouble holding your bladder so people can have urinary incontinence so it's very important to know that trouble with rapid retrieval trouble holding your urine um, trouble with balance a little bit of uh, trouble you know standing on your feet and trouble with motivation that can come from this vascular disease but remember when it's cognitive impairment you're still independent with driving you still remember to take your meds every day and you manage your own money that's really the line in the sand with dementia is if you need help with finances remembering to take pills if you're having trouble being oriented in the car remembering how to get places um, that's when we start to worry about dementia when we have uh, clogged blood vessels in the inner tiny little, you know, hair-like blood vessels, we get concerned about the frontal lobes, not because there's any vascular issue in the frontal lobes, but because that subcortical part of the brain is on a loop with the frontal lobes. So it's one of those indirect causes of brain damage. So, you know, sometimes after a stroke, people feel like they're just kind of down a notch and they just don't feel like they can get motivated. And you know, sometimes it's other things, but sometimes it's just vascular and there's not enough blood flow in that area. And that's a, yet again, another perfect example of seeing a neuropsychologist so they can help you think through that if that's you. Now, after a stroke, especially a bigger stroke, about one third of people would meet criteria for vascular dementia. Now, this is the second most common form of dementia. Now, these are much more significant impacts that do affect ability to drive, that do affect things like remembering to pay the bills, remembering what to do out of the house, okay? Pardon me, in the house. Uh, symptoms depend on what part of the brain is affected and to what extent. And again, this is why I really recommend getting your brain scan and getting someone to interpret it for you because you should know what does that part of the brain do? Was this a mild stroke? Was this a severe stroke? What's, what's expected for symptoms? Because if you have symptoms and you don't understand why, I think people really suffer because of that. And such an important message about follow-up care is to really understand the key importance of this concept. Time is brain. And that's why we always want to be using the be fast mnemonic for spotting a stroke. Many of you will have heard about fast, right? So face, arm, speech, and time. But what we worry about is that our friends who have posterior strokes, so these are strokes that come from those vertebral arteries in the back, the cerebellum, the brainstem, the pons, that these folks have symptoms that aren't considered classic stroke symptoms. And what we worry about is that they're getting turned away from the emergency room, that they're not being uh, properly respected for their symptoms. And oftentimes they're not getting CT scans until later. And sometimes they lose that window of opportunity. So you can be a good stroke advocate by making sure people use B fast. And what B includes is balance, things like uh, loss of balance, headache, dizziness, or eyes. This is where blurred vision comes in, okay? Unfortunately, these people in our community often have a trauma related to their stroke identification because it wasn't recognized early on, and that is problematic. The second reason we talked about why it's so critical to advocate for long-term care is because we know that more rehab is always better. Okay, so even several years after people have had a stroke, we know that more rehab can make a difference. And this really debunks that myth that recovery only happens after one year. Do not accept limited therapy. You deserve therapy for as long as you would like it, as long as you would benefit from it, okay? But here's the truth. You're gonna have to advocate for this long-term care. I believe right now, Medicare allows for 10 to 12 outpatient sessions as a standard after a stroke, okay? So once you meet that standard, what is it that you're supposed to do? Should you just stop your stroke recovery because Medicare tells you that you can't have any more speech therapy? Absolutely not. It doesn't mean that that's the amount of therapy that you're going to only benefit from. You are going to have to become the advocate, the warrior, the person who's out there trying to put things together, that's one of the reasons that we wrote the guide is what is out there for those people who want to try to know the, the rules of neuroplasticity so that way they can do it on their own. And the way I want you to think about this is if you run out of options in your healthcare system, you can always BYOB. Now that 
phrase might have had a different meaning two years ago, but the way I want you to think about it now is that you can better your own brain, okay? You'll never think about BYOB again <laughs> the same way. Follow appointments when you first get out of the medical system can be overwhelming. That's the time where there can be more appointments. Um, trying to make sure you keep them on schedule, trying to make sure you don't miss those appointments. Those are all very, very important. So develop a system where you track your appointments. We have something in the stroke guide for you to help do that. And ask someone that you trust that can be dependent upon to help remind you of the most important ones. I know this is kind of a, a no brainer, you all want this, but I really think it's important to work your best to try to find an engaged team, people that care about you, people that have a passion for their work. I have become very sensitive to low enthusiasm doctors lately. For I've, I've had to go to the doctor for a couple things in the last few months and I have just really been uh, not impressed with kind of the, the blahness going on. Now, sure, it's COVID. Sure, um, people, doctors are, are overworked way too hard, but I really value being positive, being enthusiastic, being individually focused, and I don't think it's that hard, and I just think that's the bare minimum of what people deserve. So if you feel depressed after you go to your neurologist or it just feels like they don't really have hope for you, get out of here. Just to please try to try to get a different doctor because it's it's important. Their, their mood and their expectations for you matter. And of course, you have to be an active participant in your care, but you probably already are because that's why you're here with me, right? You want to do everything you can. Next is to really try to get these people to communicate and to give you a plan. So to me, the best quarterbacks are going to be your neuropsychologist, your neurologist or somebody we talked about a few sessions ago called a physiatrist. Now these are doctors of physical medicine and rehab. These are your best bets for developing a long-term comprehensive recovery care. Okay, during a medical appointment, I think you really have three jobs and I want you to do all three of these as well as you can, okay? The first thing is to communicate well, listen well, and to receive a next step care plan. So let's just start with communicating well. What is your responsibility in terms of communication? Well, you have to be prepared for this appointment. You don't think you can just walk in there and you're just going to be answering questions. Maybe that's the way it worked a few years ago, but you're going to have to go in with things written down. I want you to explain in the best detail that you can what is happening to you so the doctor can understand. You need to have questions ready that you want to ask. If you can't think of any, turn to your spouse, turn to a friend, turn to a parent or a child and say, hey, um, you know, I'm gonna go into this doctor's appointment. Is there anything that you think I should ask about? What is my, what's the next step for me in terms of, of uh, optimal recovery? What's the very next thing that I can do? The second thing is to listen, right? Some of these things kind of sound like no brainers, but until we do them well, we're not getting all the benefits. Your job in that session is to listen to their recommendations. Now, the problem is all too often, brain health doctors can, in my experience, either dumb it down too much and they give you like scraps of information or they can just start talking in a way that's full of jargon and is really uh, difficult to follow. You might also have processing speed issues and you need them to slow down. It's really okay to ask them to say something another way it's okay to ask them, you know, could you write down the two most important things you said to me so I can take it away and reference it later? You want to really remember and hold on to and implement what their recommendations are, okay? And this is the one that I find people need support with the most, and this is getting a next step care plan. So every appointment that you go to, I want you to advocate for what the provider thinks you should be working on, to keep your recovery going, okay? So for example, if you determine, you know, you have a neurology appointment in a month and you still feel like you're having a little trouble with swallowing and you're choking a little bit, you know, you wanna communicate, you know, this happens when I drink water, um, you know, it's, it's bothering me because I don't, I don't think I'm hydrated enough, you know, you give some really good details. You wanna know what does that doctor think the cause of the problem is and what exactly should you do about it? Now, oftentimes the next step involves a referral to a specialist. So you want to make sure that you leave with that paper referral in your hand because referrals, 
I don't know what is going on with referrals in this world, but I can tell you from having a doctor's office that there's a lack of, of follow through. There's a lack of communication. Even recently, I had to ask for a referral. And I j just literally before I came in here to, to be with you guys today, I got a notice from the group that said they've tried to call me three times and they can no longer uh, hold my referral. And so they're dismissing me as a patient. I definitely never got a phone call from them. So I like to have the piece of paper in hand that when I leave, I have it. It's, it's not in the in charge from the doctor's office, okay? So you wanna leave the appointment too with a follow-up, right? When, it, when a neurologist says to you, you know, I'll see you again in a year, you know, I would respectfully push back on that or ask and say, you know, I would really appreciate seeing you sooner than that because I have a lot going on in my recovery and I know that time is important and I don't wanna miss a window uh, because I'm gonna see you in 12 months. So the key here is you may just have to ask for these things. Doctors can sometimes be very used to like calling all the shots, but the truth is more and more, you need to be that active participant and, and BYOB, right? So you feel comfortable asking for what it is you need. In the stroke recovery guide, we have an appointment tracker. I think Carrie's gonna send this to you all in her email once we're done meeting. This will help you prioritize what you wanna discuss, uh, what did the provider have to tell you about the cause and what were the goals and the next steps that you identified in that appointment with the person. So we're gonna end this session by talking about our self-empowerment statement. And so I would love all of you to repeat after me. I deserve follow-up care and I will do all that I can to improve the blood flow in my brain. That is such an important concept. So next time, can you believe this is going to be our last session? Rule number 10, this is where we are going to talk about the transformational power of acceptance. And remember, acceptance does not mean giving up. We're going to go through all of the, the skills and the tools that you need in order to to be more comfortable being here now. And that's going to be our last session, which is going to be a total bummer. Um, so right now let's do our Q and A session and y'all tell me, what are you thinking? What are you, you feeling? Jerry's always good for some good comments here. Let's see what Jerry said. I felt that I had great PT and OT, but I denied that I needed speech therapy for years later until I realized I need it and still do. Jerry, is that not the whole thing about prioritizing the physical, right? I would say, you know, cognition gets the backseat and then the emotional mental health stuff even gets a further backseat. And the other thing is I think speech therapy is so important, but it's got a bad name. So many of you have memory issues, processing issues, you know, and you wouldn't necessarily think I need speech therapy, right? But Absolutely, that's what those guys do. It's cognitive rehabilitation. So we don't want to, you know, forget um, that there are, you know, important things we might not be able to see, but we still need recovery for them. Jerry had another question. It's been close to a year that I had my blood work done, a blood panel because of COVID. I know. Uh, I used to have that done every six months. What would be your rule of thumb? Well, it's a great question, Jerry. I think it really depends on your medical health. If you're someone that has diabetes, if you have high cholesterol, knowing that those risk factors are related to another stroke, I would really like you to get them monitored more than once a year, right? Um, if you're someone who's younger and uh, doesn't have significant medical issues, then maybe it doesn't have to be as close. But remember, my whole thing the, the whole crux of my philosophy as a doctor is more assessment is always better because that's when you can personalize care. That's when I know what does Jerry need that's different from what Karen needs, right? And assessments, blood tests, cognitive testing, strength testing, swallow studies, brain scans. These are the tools that we use in medicine to personalize treatment. And so if you're lucky enough to have health insurance, I say, use it to the absolute max, you know, don't hesitate. And oh my gosh, especially once you meet a deductible, I mean, you know, open it up and just, just keep going, keep going. Uh, so Jerry also says regarding writing questions, Barb does write down a list of questions for when we go to the doctor. That's awesome. She covers everything regarding me. Barb sounds like such a wonderful 
person, Jerry. I'm so happy that you have her. Um, really, it, it's a, a make or break when you have your one care person, right? Your person who can be there with you side by side. So if you are lucky enough to have someone like that in your life, that's wonderful. And if you don't have someone like that right now, the truth is you always have yourself, okay? And as long as you're a good friend to yourself and a protective care partner to yourself, you can also be okay. You know, of course, it's it, it's less lonely when you have someone, but the truth is at different points in our life, many of us find ourselves alone. And so what you can't do is give in and not be a, um, not be a strong advocate for yourself, right? This is where self-esteem comes in, self-empowerment. You have to be emotionally resilient uh, in order to recover from this stroke as well as you can. Mr. Charles asked me, is severe stress, does severe stress affect your cholesterol? That's a really interesting question. I, it's, I would say it's indirectly related, not necessarily directly related. So think about when you're stressed, right? What do most people do? What do I do? You overeat, right? And we don't overeat on celery, do we? We tend to like high sugar, high fat. Last night I had a tiramisu that was through the roof. And I, the whole time I was eating it, I was like, holy smokes, this thing is floating in cholesterol and sugar, but it was amazing and I was stressed out. And so it made me feel better. Um, so in that sense, right, kind of indirectly. And then also when we are stressed, a lot of times uh, we don't deal with it by getting more active and going out and exercising, right? So then we, you know, can get depressed and, you know, can be kind of sluggish. And so we don't get the benefit of exercise there. Um, so in that sense, Charles, I would say probably high, uh, uh, blah, 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 blah. high blood pressure, hypertension is the risk factor that we more commonly associate with severe stress. But remember how they go so hand in hand. So if some of you have both high cholesterol and hypertension, you might remember that you got told about those things at right around the same time because one begets the other, right? So the minute you have the high cholesterol closing up the space between the blood vessel walls and less blood can get through, now by consequence, we have high blood pressure because that's basically what high blood pressure is. So if you imagine like a garden hose and you turn on the water, when it's coming out normally, it's because, you know, the spout is wide open as it should be. And it just kind of dribbles out at a normal speed. Well, the minute you close it up a little bit, if you put your thumb over it, so imagine that was cholesterol plaques. Now, all of a sudden it's coming in at a much higher velocity. It's much stronger. Uh, it's much more fast. And that's basically what high blood pressure is. So a lot of times it's really one thing that makes you more susceptible to another thing that makes you, you know, have less energy because you're not getting as much blood and oxygen to the big muscles in your body. And so that's why all this stuff is so important. The earlier, the better, you know, not that it's ever too late, um, but it, it definitely is a journey. It's, it's just really important to prioritize those things. All right, Mr. Charles, again, do you have a referral for a really good neuropsychologist in the Maryland, DC, Bethesda, Rockville, Potomac area? Not off the top of my head, but Charles, I will absolutely make that a priority. And that goes for any of you wonderful people. I would love nothing more if what came out of our time together is that you decided you wanted to see a neuropsychologist. If you are in uh, North Carolina, because of telehealth now, uh, you're more than welcome to get a referral to me um, to, to send to our office. Um, you can go on our website, Pinehurst Neuropsychology, and, and have your primary care or neurologist send it there. Um, or what you can do is send us an email with your zip code and let me know a little bit more about your situation. And what I do is I have a national listserv of other board certified neuropsychologists and I can email and ask people uh, and also send us your insurance if you have it. Um, and I'll do my best to find a good match for you. We've done that for many, many, many people over the years here. And I, I would love nothing more than to help you with that. That's awesome. So Jerry says, I smell smoke once in a while and I was told that is a sign of a seizure. If I feel a twitch, I think I'm gonna have a seizure. I'm good though, life is great. Jerry is so positive. Um, so olfactory hallucinations, which is smelling smoke is absolutely related to seizure. It's also related to a couple other things. So um, if someone has tied it 
to your seizures, Jerry, I'm sure that that's true. A lot of times people will talk about smelling like electrical wires burning. Uh, oftentimes it's things burning. And I, I'm not, I don't think anyone has ever figured out what exactly that means beside the fact that seizures are electrical overactivity. Um, I am sure that must be such a tough thing psychologically if you start to feel a little twitch to feel like you're going to go into a seizure. I mean, it's it's almost too much to ask of someone to not go down that road because it's I think it's very hardwired in your amygdala. But what you can do is immediately go into positive coping mode, which is deep breathing, getting yourself in a safe position, making sure you know you hydrate. Uh, start to do the grounding exercises, you know, put your feet on the ground and imagine those deep roots going deep into the earth and, you know, kind of holding on. Um, sometimes distraction can really work. Um, but I think that's one of those real survivor skills that you learn when you have seizures or whatever your stroke symptoms are, is how to kind of ride the wave until you get to the other time. I know a lot of people whose stroke started off with a headache really struggle with this because headaches are really common, right? Um, and so if they feel a little twinge or they get a little tension headache, it's kind of like this feeling like you're a sitting duck and your brain wants you to see that as an alarm because it was traumatic and it was threatening. And so the brain is giving you all sorts of, um, you know, threat messages. Your heart is starting to beat faster. You are getting clammy. You're starting to get tense in your muscles. I mean, those things are happening. So what a good psychologist can help you do is recognize that they're happening, you know, don't be oblivious. And then you just go into your positive coping so you can ride that wave and get to the other side. You guys are the best. I really love this time. I'm going to be totally bummed when I'm not doing this uh, every Thursday afternoon. This has been really, really enjoyable. I so appreciate your time and being here with us and really look forward to next week's session. I think it's the culmination of everything that we have talked about together and um, I'll really be excited to see you guys next time. So I hope you have a great rest of your night and take very good care. Okay, bye-bye.